Mac Power Users, episode 601, Soup Blasphemy with Kathy Campbell. Hello, everyone. This is David Sparks. I am joined today by my co-host, Mr. Stephen Hackett. How are you today, Stephen? I'm good, David. How are you? I am outstanding, I I have to say. I, I'm just doing pretty well today, man. That's good. Yeah. I like to hear that. Yeah. Uh, the uh, And we got a guest today. Welcome to the show, Kathy Campbell. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, overdue. You know, we, uh, we're both fans of Kathy Campbell and... Uh, we kind of wanted to get you on Mac Power User so we could get down to the bottom of your workflows. <laughs> I'm I'm so excited to share my glitter. All right. Uh, before we get into the glitter, uh, today when we get to the end of the show for more Power Users, we are going to dive deep on all the new rumors around Apple Silicon. It seems like we're getting more seems like we're getting a lot more consistent rumors about the timeline about all these new Macs to come out. So we're going to we're going to hit in that. Are you going to stay around with us, Kathy, and help us talk about new Macs? If you'll have me, I don't know how much I'll be able to contribute, but I will be here and I will make words with my mouth. There we go. That's all we need. And um, uh, Kathy, for folks who don't know you, can you tell us a little bit about you? Yeah, I am Kathy Campbell, also known as Mrs. Soup in the chat or on all of the social medias. Uh, Mrs. Soup, because last name is Campbell. Campbell like the soup. Ha ha, so funny. Do you know how long it took me to work that out? <laughs> Not as long as one of the members of my bridal party who took almost 10 years to figure it out. But, you know, I'm always, it always makes me so happy when I get a tweet or message message of some sort that's like, oh my gosh, I just got it. It makes me so happy to do. And I love it. <laughs> well, what is, since we're there, I mean, what is your favorite Campbell soup? I mean, you must have one, right? Well, here's the thing. I don't actually like a lot of soup. Oh my gosh. I know. I know. It's oh, blasphemy. You're um, a fraud. You're a fraud. <laughs> I'll, I'll pick um, clam chowder. Okay. As my as my uh, choice, but uh, as family, um, my uncle uh, kind of helped us identify which soups we were. Um, I am apparently chicken noodle. My husband is tomato, and then our child is split pea. Um, I can and so, absolutely see you as chicken noodle. <laughs> makes total sense. I love it. When I was pregnant, um, we called our kid uh, Split P um, before we knew the sex of the baby. So that was always fun. That's a very specific BuzzFeed quiz. <laughs> yeah. What that soup, is. Are, what soup you? are you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, tweet me at Mrs. Soup uh, with what soup you identify as. <laughs> well, Kathy, in addition to uh, to being named after soup but not particularly liking soup <laughs> <laughs> i understand although i have to agree most soup out of a can isn't isn't really soup yeah. but the, uh, either way um uh, tell us a little bit about uh your business and and what you do yeah i am the unicorn sidekick so i'm kind of a business unicorn that helps um businesses and industries all over the place uh kind of getting their stuff together, um, helping support them in ways that they need, uh, in helping identify what they need or doing it for them or kind of just being that magical support person um, to better help them allow their business to run the way it needs to run without letting it run them as a business owner. Yeah, and the thing Kathy does that really makes her such a great guest for Mac Power users is she helps her clients with their technology. And one of her assignments quite often is a client will come and tell them a problem they're having, and she'll find the appropriate technology solution to help them solve it. And as a result, she spends her time studying all these great tools, and all of a sudden she's got this wealth of knowledge. So we're going to tap into that today. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but also, Kathy, you are bilingual. I mean, you speak Mac and and IBM PC. You don't call them IBM PC anymore, right? No. It's just Windows. <laughs> well, I'm, I am old. I'm so old. Yeah. 
So she speaks Windows and Mac and Android and iPhone and all the various platforms. And I just thought with all this experience, you'd be, um, it'd be great to help you, uh, have you tell your story a little bit to our audience. Yeah. Um, I, I, I will admit it's been a while. It always takes me a little bit of extra to translate PC, um, because I have been away from it for so long that, um, if I have a client that uses PC, I'm like, okay, it's not the Apple. You got to go to the start button. That's right. Okay. And then not command it's control and just all of the little things. So, so I'm not, I don't know if I'd call myself bilingual so much as random, you know, student who visits the, uh, country that they've taken, you know, three years of language in and stumbles around and pretends that they know what they're talking about. Yeah, I get it. I, I got, I think I got um, jerked around by a listener at some point because somebody wrote in saying, um, you know, should they be defragging? And I said on the show, you shouldn't. And then on the forums, they roasted me. Apparently, <laughs> nobody defrags on Windows anymore. But I, I don't know. I got an email asking about it. So I answered the question. <laughs> right. <laughs> but the, uh, you know, That's right. Uh, I guess I need to spend more time on the Windows side, too. But the um, but either way, uh, so Kathy has kind of got her hands in a lot and does a lot of kind of like um, uh, system consulting, I guess is the way I would put it. And I bumped into Kathy both on behalf of clients and, and she's just so knowledgeable and I thought it'd be really great having you in. Uh, so, so how did you get into Apple gear? You're yeah. a fairly recent switcher, right? Yeah, pretty recent. I, um, my very first Apple device was um, an iPod nano um, the very first generation because I didn't have the money for a big one. Um, and so I was super excited when they came with the little one and I used that for walking my dog and all of that. I wish I knew how many PC people came over to Apple through the, through the iPod. I really wish oh. there was a way to, to, to put a number to that. Probably I mean, a lot. so many, so yeah. many. I, I, I was talking to Jason Snell about this recently and they had a, yeah, they had a, I think it was the iMac G5 introduction. Their press was like from the makers of iPod. And it's like, <laughs> holy cow. I mean, so many of us thought about it the other way around. But that Nano in particular, the mini before it, but really the Nano was like such a a powerful, especially like holiday purchase. I mean, they were just yeah. everywhere overnight. And it was really kind of Apple at its best in terms of great user interface just a really good customer experience i'm sure a lot of people are like hey you know what this is better because i know at that time you did have to defrag a, a windows computer <laughs> and uh, so i i do feel like that um i i would just be curious and apple i bet apple has some numbers on that but it i'm sure it's huge yeah it was also so it the iPod really was the best music device. Um, and so when we were looking, my company that I was working at at the time had a discount for AT&T. And so I was like, well, I'm going to get an iPhone. We jumped in on the iPhone 3G when the 3GS came out because there was that big discount for the previous gen. And since it was our first iPhones, it was better than, you know, what we had currently. I think we were using Palm Trios and it was great. That was the phone I took pictures of our new baby with, you know, it was, it was exciting and great. Um, and then we ended up having to switch uh, phone carriers to Verizon, um, and they didn't have the iPhone yet. So yeah. we got, I think I got um, like the little blackjack phone. Oh, boy. I don't, oh yeah, boy. it was, yeah. I thought it was super cool, but then it stopped doing things that I needed to do. And I was like, okay, I got to go back to an iPhone, but it took a while to get there. Um, and the, the thing that made me get there was I started working at Apple and working Apple retail in one of the busiest stores in Portland and was super excited when our contracts switched so that I would be able to charge my phone at work because of course there were so many, you know, dongles to plug in your phone to get a little bit of extra juice that you needed to get through the workday. 
Um, and that was a real highlight, uh, for my day was being able to not have a dead mm-hmm. phone. Yeah. You also don't want to be the person with the blackjack who works at the Apple store. I mean, true. Uh, that was also yeah. a big part. <laughs> yeah, you know, I had, I had a very similar journey. I, I had the first several iPhones and then we had to switch to Verizon because at the time AT&T's coverage at St. Jude was terrible and, Our son was at St. Jude a lot, and so I carried a Motorola Droid and later a Palm Pre for a while. And let me tell you, I ordered the Verizon iPhone 4 the second it became available. (laughs) So so then you worked at Apple, and that's kind of where you kind of fell into the Mac, right? Yeah, um, I will say that discount, that employee discount finally pushed me over uh, the edge. And now I'm just like, oh my goodness, how did I not use a Mac for so long. It's so great not having to do a lot of the building stuff that I felt like I always was doing with the PC, constantly defragging or installing updates that would just completely shut down your computer for the full day or, oh, you need to upgrade the RAM. I'm like, I don't want to mess with my computer. I want it to just do what I need it to do. And um, so I got my first iMac and it was amazing and i haven't looked back so what's your mac these days i use the imac pro um and it's a great workhorse um i do most of my work in my office so i don't need a laptop um and if i do need a laptop i have my uh ipad pro um to move around. Sometimes I'm working from the hammock. So I've got my iPad with me. Uh, But for the most part, I sit at my desk. This is my office. This is my work time. Um, I know I I try and have a very strict line from work and play. um, And so segment kind of my brain a little bit easier um, by having, you know, this when I'm at my desk, I'm working when I'm not at my desk, I'm not working as much as possible. Yeah, th- this is a great bookend for the Drang episode we did a few weeks ago because because Dr. Drang tried to use the iPad as his remote computer with his you know desktop machine to do his his heavy work on, and ultimately he couldn't do it. But you can, and I know that you've been using the iPad remotely not only through the pandemic, but you're looking forward to traveling with it as well. We're gonna get into that deeper later in this episode, but just kind of switching back to the iMac. Um, what is it, or the iMac Pro, what is it that led you to buy that machine and like, how'd you spec it out? Yeah, I, I needed to, um, process video. I, um, up until recently was, um, an editor of a YouTube show. So I needed to be able to have, uh, it was, it was dragging my, uh, iMac was just not as powerful as I needed it to be. Um, and so between that and all of the, I do a lot of photography. And so I need to run all of these batch processes to, uh, run my photos, um, and then recording and, and quick stuff that I just needed to be more, I don't know, horsepower or whatever you want to like specifics yeah. you want to say. Um, it was uh, great. It did come out, you know, right before the M1 was announced is when I bought it. But you know what? It, it was so long until the iMac version of it. And I knew I couldn't handle just the laptop. So I was like, OK, let's do it. Yeah, it, it is crazy how those relatively inexpensive M1s are matching iMac Pro performance. Yeah, I just Stephen. Just over the weekend, I taught Daisy Final Cut, mm-hmm. and now she's doing all the editing for the DLR Field Guide stuff, and she's doing it on a MacBook Air, an M1 MacBook Air. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I I can't I don't understand how she can do it on that screen, but she's fine. And uh, but it's just like, who would thought that you'd be running Final Cut and like editing a half hour long video on a um. <laughs> on a MacBook Air, a MacBook Air, and not 4K. wanting to, th- yeah, not wanting to throw it across the room. And it's yeah. 4K footage, by the way. You mm-hmm. know, it's not like small footage. And that's that's where the iMac Pro is such an odd machine. I mean, I know Kathy, you and I talked a lot about yeah. what machine you should buy. And sorry, I recommended a machine that would get discontinued, but um, it's it, fine. <laughs> it it really is a fantastic computer. I mean, I think objectively, like it is the best 
Intel computer Apple maybe has ever made because the Mac Pro is so expensive. That really takes points away from it, I think. But yeah. the iMac Pro, I mean, Dave and I both each had one and I loved it. It was a fantastic machine. And even I think years into the Apple Silicon transition, it will continue to be fantastic, honestly. Yeah, I'm really happy with it, especially because there's some things that I use that don't work with the M1. Um, and so being able to have everything that I need, I'm I'm so content with this for the next however many years until it finally, you know, jumps off a cliff and doesn't work anymore. But I'm not good. I'm not looking to upgrade or change this machine for a long time. Yeah, and it, it will run a long time because yeah. that cooling system in that computer, that's just a far superior computer t- to your like vanilla iMac. Yes. Uh, what What is your, like, are you into keyboards and mice? It seems to me like everybody at Relay is like <laughs> got like some fetish over keyboards. I got to know where, where you stand on this. <laughs> um, thanks to the amazing people in the Relay Discord, I have a Ducky 2 full-size computer, which has the number pad on it. Um, I love the RGB. I love it. I have some rainbow keycaps um, and it's so sparkly and bright and just makes me so happy to play with um, and type with. And um, I didn't think I would ever be that type of clicky keyboard person just because so many of the times the the ones that I had seen were boring. You know, oh, look at these black ones. Ooh, yeah. Black keycaps. So exciting. And then I learned that that was incorrect and there are so many cute um keycaps and it makes me really really happy yeah my daughter has been admiring i have a keychron keyboard Mm -hmm. and she keeps admiring it so and she's working really hard i'm like well why don't you just use my keyboard and she was super happy to do that so i've been back with an apple keyboard and i have to admit I kind of like the Apple keyboard too. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's just easy to type on this low profile. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm re- reverting out of the keyboard exploration days. What, Stephen, I've never asked you that. What do you use for a keyboard? Yeah, I use the Apple Bluetooth Magic Keyboard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't have, <laughs> I mean, I have a Keychron on my PC yeah. and that's fine, but I don't like using something with a lot of travel for yeah. everyday use, to be honest. It's really nice having a number pad back because I've, of course, I've scripted a bunch of my keyboard maestro scripts to the number pad keys. Mm-hmm. And now all of a sudden, it's like a second stream deck. You know, I've got another set of macro buttons on my, in front of me, which is kind of nice. Anyway, um, Kathy, uh, what, what, which iPhone do you carry? Uh, I have the 12 Pro Max. I just recently got the big boy again, mainly because of the camera. And oh, goodness, am I so happy. I cannot believe I went um, because I had the the 10 and the 11 regular sized. Yeah. um, And went back to the max. And man, oh, especially with a pop socket and the MagSafe pop socket specifically, the size is just so great. It doesn't bother me because I have the balance set up. I'm so glad you have a MagSafe pop socket. I've been wanting to talk to somebody that owns one forever. Oh my gosh. It's the best thing ever. It's so good. I'm afraid it would like fall off. I mean, is how, how, because every time I've used a pop socket, I would like lace it between my index and middle finger. Yep. And that's how I would hold the phone. But what if it came off? I mean, is it, how well does it grip on? It holds it so well. The only time I have had it come off when I didn't mean it to is when I dropped my phone. Well, that would be why you dropped your phone because it came off. No, I dropped my phone because I was pulling it out of my purse and it went flying. So I wasn't Ah. using the MagSafe and Mm. it popped off because it hit the ground. All right. Would you just do me a favor real quick? I just need you to take a minute here and I want you to stand up. I want you to grab it by the pocket. I want you to swing your arms around as hard as you can in a circle. Like, you know, like like you're uh, on a ship and you're um, signaling them to come get you like SOS. Uh, No problem there. I'm also like, I have it in between my pointer and middle finger and I'm like, um, 
oscillating back and forth between like, so it's horizontal and I don't, I don't know how to describe it, but I'm like (laughs) rocking it back and forth like a seesaw. Oh, wow. Um, And it's still, it's still connected. It's so, it's super strong, but it's also super easy to pull off. So just by holding the phone and then just like rotating my hand up and then it like just sits back on super easy. I am so happy with this. So happy. Highly recommend. Highly, highly recommend. Are they just black now? That's the only color, right? Nope. Nope. All sorts of colors. Mine is um, a white uh, with gold marble on it. Um, And then the pop socket itself is the um, swappable tops. So you can put whatever type um, pop socket on top. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Use code, (laughs) I don't know, something to receive. uh, No, I don't know. I I should be an affiliate for them. I I have gone all in with the MagSafe lifestyle. I I, I just wrote a review. It's going to be up by the time the show uh, publishes. I bought the Apple battery, the overpriced Apple battery. You know, which everybody says is a dumb purchase. It's like, in fact, I wrote in the review, never could you get less bang for more buck in a battery. <laughs> and the, uh, but the fact is, it's so convenient. Like, because, you know, my big use case is Disneyland. And right. I don't want to have a cable stretched out from my bag to my pocket. And, or like, or you got to do it while you eat. And if you forget, then, you know, and just having this thing you can snap on and snap off is super nice. So, it's overpriced, but the Apple MagSafe battery, I use the MagSafe case. I got the wallet. Now I'm going to own the pop socket. I'm going to have, going to collect them all. <laughs> all right. Are you doing that stuff, Stephen? Have you gone down that road? I mean, MagSafe, yes. Pop socket, no. Uh, the only pop socket in my life is on a Kindle, actually. Nice. But, but yeah, I use the leather MagSafe case and I too bought the battery and um, it's fine i don't want to ruin your review but my review is it's fine <laughs> yeah that's basically it i think i had a, the short version was it's um it costs too much but it works good but it's convenient mm-hmm. <laughs> that's a great resounding you know uh yeah, i know woo. <laughs> oh boy this episode of the mac power users is brought to you by one password go to onepassword.com slash mpu in all caps to get 20% off. With a 1Password for Family account, you can keep your family safe online with the world's most loved password manager. We all deal with the problem of tracking multiple passwords and coming up with strong and unique passwords. 1Password solves that problem for you and so much more. First of all, with 1Password, you just sign in with one click. 1Password makes it easy to create and use strong passwords and log into any app or website within seconds. You can determine not only how the password is generated, but what it looks like. So if you want to make a password that's a string of unrelated words, you can do that. Or if you want the traditional long string of random digits and numbers, it can do that too. And with 1Password for Families, sharing is easy. You can share logins, passwords, credit cards, and other important information with people who matter most. Over the weekend, my wife had a scare that she thought she lost her wallet. We did find it, so it wasn't stolen or lost. But if she had lost it, we have shared between us all of our credit cards and banking information. Not only does 1Password keep the details of those cards, it lets you take pictures of them. So if I had to dial up the 1-800 numbers and, you know, let them know to cancel those cards, it would have been trivial for me. And the protection you get with 1Password runs much deeper than that. You can protect your entire family from hacks and breaches, making it easy to use your strong passwords and find security problems with the websites you use. For instance, 1Password will give you an alert when an account is compromised, so you can update the password right away. If a family member gets locked out, you can recover their 1Password access, and you can even identify weak or duplicate passwords in your database and websites where you can turn on two-factor authentication. And both Stephen and I recommend that. Get that two-factor authentication going wherever you can. The best thing is you can introduce your family to better online security and safer browsing habits with a 1Password for Families account. So what are you waiting for? Head over to onepasswordcom slash MPU. Put that in all caps. You get that 20% off. And sign up for 1Password for your family today. 
So, Kathy, we've talked about your gear, and we we touched on your business a little bit, but I really want to get get into it. Uh, and I should say, you do a lot of work for Relay FM, which I'm very glad for because you are awesome. Oh, thank uh, you. But tell people a little bit about sort of what you're doing. You say you're this unicorn sidekick for a bunch of different types of businesses, but what are you doing? What sort of tasks? What sort of clients? Fill us in. Yeah. Um, when I talk to people that are like, what What do you do? Just kind of like this. Um, I basically say that I am an online business manager. Um, so a lot of times if you go into like a doctor's office, there's somebody there that is um, – the business manager and they're in charge with making sure everyone's doing what they're supposed to be doing or looking at making sure the software that they have is the right software for them. Or if they need to change to a different medical records, whatever, um, they'll be in charge of that. They make sure everyone is um, as happy as they can be. Um, Any changes that need to be done, you know, they're in charge of that. And that's kind of, where I come in for businesses that maybe can't or don't want to hire someone that's specific for that role, Um, whether they don't have the work for it or there's no need to hire like someone to sit in an office to do whatever. Um, They just need somebody that can help support the owners in the way that they need it. Um, a lot of times the businesses that I work with, um, are solopreneurs or people in a partnership that have started and the businesses that they started, they did everything themselves. Um, (laughs) sounds familiar. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if that sounds familiar at all, but you know, let's, uh, let's, let's pretend for a moment that you're in a business where yeah, it happens you do to be a everything. Podcast network. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it can be really difficult to get some help and to trust somebody, um, to take things off of your plate. But if you get to a point where you are too busy, too popular, too many clients, you need help and that support. Um, and I love being able to come and help people's businesses and their passions and their dreams explode into the stratosphere just by helping let them do what they love. And that gives me so much joy and happiness to be able to support um, people making their dreams happen. Yeah, I, I know with us, and I definitely want to hear some other examples, but yeah. for, for Mike and I, we had a lot of bottlenecks as we grew and those bottlenecks were us, right? There's only so much he and I could do yep. in a given day or week or month or whatever it was. And so finding those tasks, you know, it's hard. It's hard to give things up when you built something from the ground up. But uh, my sense is that we're not alone in that sort of feeling. Not at all. Not at all. Every single time that I have started um, working with somebody, the the project that brought them to me is not the one that they ended up needing the most help with. Um, Something that uh, like, oh, I need somebody to manage, you know, my social media, but really they didn't have client processes in place. And so they were, you know, making from scratch every onboarding process. So being able to come in and say, hey, this is the bottleneck that you're having right now. I know that you've been doing this onboarding the way that you've done it for years because that's the only way you knew it. But what if we did this and we have these templates in place and you're able to have a checklist that makes sure that you get their home address so that when you have to send them, you know, a W-9, you can get that processed easily. Um, So being able to have another pair of eyes to look at how something's going or what's working or not working and being able to just kind of give suggestions and guide uh, the way into making their business as great as possible. I really think that is like the idea of getting help is so hard for people, especially yes. people who build their own thing. And I, I have experienced the same problem. I'm, I'm a control freak when it comes to my own <laughs> little things, right? Yeah. And I always feel like nobody else could do it, but I don't have enough time to do it. Uh, but it, personally, what I always tell people is just start with something small. It's like you need to get that confidence that you can hand off anything 
before you can get to that big thing. A hundred percent. And a lot of times, um, so most of the time when I start working with a client, I um, have them go through and uh, process a delegation matrix. Um, and what they do is um, for people that maybe don't time track or don't have their projects listed out, I have them go a full week and write down, you know, kind of what they've done, what they're doing, invoicing or phone calls or emails or, you know, all of these things. And a lot of times in that process, they can better recognize what takes up most of their day. Um, And then I have them take those projects and put it into um, four quadrants. So there's on one side, there's the things that they freaking love and they're really good at. And then on the opposite end is the things that they hate doing and that take forever because they're not as great. Um, So I have them put everything that they've done that week into those boxes. I will also ask them, you know, if there's anything that they do once a month, so invoicing or payouts or whatever will specifically go elsewhere. And this really helps a lot of times will help them recognize the areas that they need more help in because they're like, oh, I didn't realize that I could have somebody else triage my emails or find software for me or whatever needs to happen. And so a lot of times we're able to kind of glitter their business in a way that they didn't realize because the glitter seeps into the areas that they had these big bottlenecks in without realizing that they were even bottlenecks until um, I started asking questions. Steven, you went through this process with Kathy, right? Yeah, we did. We sat down and, uh, you know, really for me, I, I, I wasn't, uh, maybe a little better repair than some people. I had a yes. list of things that I thought, hey, these are things that I would like someone else to take on. Most of it administrative type tasks, you know, things that people don't necessarily see who listen to the shows, but are really important to how the business itself runs. And we had been through this process once before with um, with uh, Carrie, our sales manager. She came on and helped Mike with his side of the business, but now it was time to have somebody help me with uh, with mine, and so I had some some tasks, and we we worked through those. And uh, what I learned very quickly that when you have somebody like Kathy come into your business, is they see the parts of your procedures or policies that you maybe set in my case, you know, five or six years previously that maybe didn't make as much sense anymore. And so that it was not only hey, these are things that I need somebody to help with, but using her experience to help shape what else I was doing has been huge as well. Yeah. uh, Steven was definitely one of the most prepared uh, people that I onboarded um, because he ran his business like a business, um, which sounds silly, but a lot of times the people that I've come in with are, have maybe started the business as a hobby or as a side gig. And they did, a lot of it by themselves in, you know, the downtime in between their nine to five. And so their processes were very uh, haphazard and they maybe barely had gotten into this full time themselves or even sometimes still it was their side gig um, and needed control and and support. And so, uh, yeah, Stephen was one of the easiest people to onboard. And, um, even though, you know, like always, there's always mistakes that get made. Um, but we helped it really, those mistakes help streamline our process and make sure that there are fail safes in, in place so that we don't make those mistakes again. Yeah. One of the things I did this year, and, uh, this was on the advice of a friend, Ernie Svensson, who's been on the show before. And, I wrote down in January 24 things that I don't want to do anymore. You know, I just looked at all the stuff I do and I decided every month I'm going to hand two of those things off. And so that's like on my monthly checklist. And at this point we're in August and I've handed off like 14 items at this point. That's amazing. You know, I'm tracked to hit 24 by the end of the year, but it, it is something that I think anybody who, uh, is trying to, you know, do a lot of work should consider. And really it all comes down to that control thing. Can you let go? Can you yes. hand it off to somebody? 
Yeah, it's it's difficult. And it you have to have a level of trust um, on both sides to be able to have those communications and those conversations um, for both ends. And I understand how difficult it is. I mean, I'm going through this myself on my side with handing off things myself. And I get it. It's it's difficult and it's it it can be really exhausting. Um, but it's also so worth it um, when you don't even have to worry about something anymore because it just gets taken care of. That is so funny that you have trouble with this too when that's your entire business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like the cobbler's kids don't have shoes, that that yeah. whole that whole thing. <laughs> yeah. So in, in dealing with uh, a bunch of different clients, a, a bunch of different types of businesses, uh, how do you go about communicating with those clients and then staying on top of what they need? Yeah. So every client um, communicates in a different way. Um, so sometimes I'm in Slack, sometimes I'm in email, sometimes in text message or Facebook messenger. It all, my job is to make sure that they are able to communicate in the easiest way that they can do. Just not a phone call. Never call me. If you're calling me, I'm expecting somebody's dead, <laughs> plain and simple. <laughs> um, and so this also helps me segment my client work. So I know, hey, if I'm in the Relay Slack channel, I'm working on Relay. If I am in, you know, uh, a text message with a client, I'm in that text. You know, this is the client that I'm working with. Um, I could say, all right, this is the Unicorn Sidekick Discord Everyone, all of my clients need to communicate me directly through here, but that would actually break my brain more than the way that I do it now. Um, the same with like all of my relay work, I use Google Chrome. So anytime I'm working on relay, I'm in Chrome. All of the rest of my work, I pretty much use Safari, but relay because of the the type and the style and and the things that I do for you, that's all in. Chrome. And so that is my little home space for relay work. And just like with my working, not working like segment, it's kind of like wearing a different hat for each of my clients or um, going into a different office every time. And it's really important for me to be able to segment that so that I can give my full brain space to the client that I'm currently working on. Yeah, I do think that that ability, and this is even if you're not working with an outside person, that ability to switch gears mm -hmm. and go say, okay, I'm now long, no longer working on X and now I'm working on Y. I think that's huge. My ability to not multitask, because we all know multitasking is is fake, it's not real, but um, that context switching and that, that quick switch um, is how my brain works best. So being able to say, oh, I've got an email from somebody let me switch my brain into that mode so that I can reply real quick, get that processed, make a task or do whatever needs to be done for it, and then go back to whatever project I was working on um, is a real benefit into how I work. And it is how I've fixed my business to work that way. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think getting good at that context switching takes practice. Do you have advice for people who may be listening to this and kind of realizing, oh man, I could really use this either in my setup or in how my technology is or et cetera? Yeah. Um, spatially is really important. So if you have maybe not, I mean, actually using, you know, the, what is it called? The spaces or whatever, where you have like the full screen changes. Yeah. yeah. Having something like that could be really great um, to be able to say, oh, this website or this document is for client A. Um, and then I switch to a different space and that's client B. Having something that you physically have to move. So whether it's a click or a keystroke or whatever, so that you are in that different space can really help trick your brain into thinking, oh, well, it's time for X, Y, or Z, um, especially if you could have color changes. Um, so if you're using, um, I don't know, a, a specific background that, okay, when I'm on my purple background, I'm working on client A. And when it's yellow background, it's client B. Those little things that can 
trick your brain into making sure that you are in the right space for the right client. So you're using the right words, the right, you know, whatever. Um, But then also making sure that you are checking in with how the work is going. So making sure that you are able to recognize any of your own um, things that you're having a hard time with. So whether that means, okay, for my task, whether that means having multiple task management softwares for different clients um, so that you know, okay, when I'm ready to work on Relay, I'm going to go into X and this is the stuff that I'm going to do or a different pen color in your paper planner or, you know, whatever it does, whatever you need to really trick your brain so you're not having as much of a processing time because you're just like, oh, this is the pen that I use when I'm working on this or or whatever. Um, there's so many different ways that you can get, you can trick your brain. It's all about tricking your brain. Yeah. And that, that color background thing, because with spaces, you can have a different desktop color for each space. And not only does that work for client context, it also works for working context. Like you could have a screen where you have your email and your messages and all your communication tools. And Mm -hmm. maybe you make that green and then you have another space where you're doing, you know, your heavy client work and you make that yellow. And as dumb as this sounds, having that color in the background actually does, I think, help trick your brain to kind of get in gear to say, okay, I'm doing communications and that's why I'm here. And that makes such a big difference. Such a huge difference. This episode of MPU is made possible by Electric. You have a whole fleet of Apple devices, and they used to be arranged neatly. Dear IT professional, they were carried to and from an office predictably, handed directly to one of your team members on day one, and used precisely for work and securely connected to the office network. But of course, today they're strewn across the land. Your company iPads, iPhones, and Macs are out there connecting to dodgy Wi-Fi, mistakenly being left behind or moonlighting as a child's toy in playrooms turned work-from-home offices. Well, thanks to Electric, you don't have to worry about what could be going wrong because Electric gives you fully supported device management for your Apple devices. Electric device management automates device provisioning and setup, remotely enforces security and compliance across your fleet, and gives you visibility into your device inventory and health at all times. Electric uses the world's leading mobile device management providers and tops it off with world-class IT support. They have over 100 IT specialists ready to field your team's requests. So stop stressing over scattered devices. Head on over to electric.ai slash MPU to get started. And just for taking a qualified meeting with their team, they'll give you a pair of Beat Solo 3 wireless headphones. That's pretty cool. It's electric.ai slash MPU. Get your free pair of Beat Solo 3 wireless headphones today when you schedule a meeting to learn about electric device management. Our thanks to Electric for their support of the show. So, Kathy, you, uh, you're helping a lot of people. A lot of this involves picking the right technology tools. I thought it'd be fun to kind of talk through some of the the stuff you look at, the stuff you use for running your business, and the stuff you recommend to the folks that you work with. Um, and let's start with email, because one thing you said earlier was that sometimes clients need you to triage email for them. Yeah. And that to me is like a mind blowing concept. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I've thought of it before, but I never can actually get myself to hand that off to somebody. I mean, what are the email apps you're using and, and how does that process work? Yeah. For my own email, I use mail.app because I'm able to funnel in all of the email types that I have. I have a variety of Google workspace emails, uh, IMAP, POP. All of, all of the things and all the emails, all of yeah. the emails. Um, and I, I broke my Curly's brain a little bit when we were screen sharing at one point and he saw all of the email accounts that I had in my email. And I'm, and I'm sorry, Mike, for, for, for hurting your soul a little bit, but, <laughs> um, I, 
I like to keep it all the same so that when I'm on my phone, it's the same as when I'm on my desktop. So it's easy to process. It's, it looks the same. Um, and then for client work, um, a lot of times, uh, most of it is the Google um, business type thing. So I uh, manage email for two clients and both of them are are Google. And so I'm able to just log into the workspace on my um, browser. And when I'm in that space, I'm managing that email. And um, both of the people that I do email for, I've been working with for many, many years. So they, I know how... I know a lot of answers to the questions that these people have. So I don't have to check with them, check with the clients, say, oh, is this the way that it needs to go? I just I just know that. Um, and so being able to quickly reply to that using text expander or um, just my brain to quick type it out, send it on. I'll make a task if they need it or uh, for emails that either I know that they need to manage or to know the information or whatever. I'm sorting it into the folders for them. Um, there are, they do use, you know, the tagging systems in Gmail. So if something comes to a particular email address, it will have a tag. But being able to say, oh, this is just, you know, uh, uh, for your information thing, I can just archive that. Um, but if it's something that they need to process or they need to do something with, I can just put it into the follow-up folder that they are. So when they log into their email, all they have to do is go directly to that follow-up folder and they know that these are the emails that they need to answer. It's a big leap. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, it, it definitely can be intimidating and scary, but it's also... A lot of times email is not as important or vital as it can be because you're when you're when you're looking at your emails, you're like, oh my goodness, I have 30 emails I have to reply to, and it's gonna take, you know, X amount of time. But most of the time, you are gonna probably know the answer to that. Uh, so you're just like, oh, well, let me just, you know, da da da, let me sit and just type and reply and move on. Uh, but if you have somebody else looking at your emails, they don't necessarily have the 10 years of history with the particular client that sent you an email. Um, so they don't need to necessarily, let's be honest, as great as it is to say, hey, how's the wife doing? Um, that's also not why they're emailing you. That's not necessarily why they're contacting you. You don't need to know, you know, ask a question about you know, whatever is going on in the personal life, because this is a business email. Um, and so being able to write back real quick, hey, this is what's going on. This is uh, what I need from you. Let's get it done. Um, it can be so much easier to manage. And then, yes, you can reach out to your clients however you need to in, in other ways to be personal. But most of the time, they just want the answer to their question. That's that's why they're emailing you. That's why they're trying to get there. And, uh, and at the end of the day, the, by having the answer really quickly, um, they're super happy and they're able to go about their day. Yeah, that's that's a really healthy attitude about it. <laughs> my, my attitude, my uh, my relationship with email is is a strained one sometimes, but but you know, I I get it. Let's go on to calendar management. I think that's another thing that I think a lot of people need help with. Uh, when someone comes to you, what are the apps that you recommend and, and the ones you find work the best? Yeah, for for calendars, it really depends on how they work and also where they work. Um, I've used Fantastical for a bit, and it stopped. I don't know what's going on with the widget. The widget broke for the iPhone and it drives me absolutely bananas. So I've actually switched back to the regular Apple calendar. Um, and I have all of my calendars in there um, and links to other calendars so that I have, you know, like the incomparable recording schedule and and all of that. And I, I use my calendar a lot, um, kind of the calendar blocking. But of course, most of the work that I do can't be calendar blocked because it's so many quick context um, switching. So a lot of times I'll use it for 
for projects that need a chunk of time. Um, so for a lot of the things that I do for Relay, it needs a concentrated, you know, hour to sit and do that project. And so I put that in the calendar so I don't schedule a doctor's appointment because this needs to be done on the first of the month or you know, whatever ends up having to happen. Um, and so my calendar is a little bit of my to-do list, but not really, but kind of. Um, and so for most of, the, of my clients, if they need help with their cal- calendar, I try and figure out how do they work? Do they need calendar blocking? Do they need to use it as a to-do list? There's no right or wrong way to do it. It all depends on how your brain works. What are some, I mean, what's the most innovative use of shared calendaring that you've implemented or seen lately? I mean, you work with so many clients. I I feel like this whole idea of shared calendars is like a blessing and a curse. (laughs) And I I mean, I mean that in the, if you're listening, you know what I mean? Like there's some people that abuse the right to have access to your calendar, Mm. but there's also, I think a right way to do it, but I'm not really sure what that is, you know? And I was wondering if you if you've given that any thought there, it's so hard because there really is no one right way. And it kind of depends on how the client uses their calendar. Um, and, and what process they, you end up needing to calendar for somebody. Um, most of the time I actually have started using Calendly, for any client stuff. So I have a text expander snippet that does the specific calendar that's needed for whatever the client needs. Um, And so instead of sitting and saying, okay, well, how does Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central time, that's 8 a.m. my time. So I need to look at the calendar. Like instead of playing that game, just sending the link and letting my clients' clients figure it out so much better. Because we've also configured the Calendly the way that they need to. So specific calendar for a a specific type of call will only accept on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 to 2. Like, so I don't have to sit and play the game of, okay, well, how long is this meeting going to take? Like any of that, it's all pre-configured. So there's no thinking needed from my side the default behavior usually is to say, okay, well, give us access to your calendar. And then when somebody wants to, you know, have a meeting with you, we'll just tell them anytime that you're not busy. And that is like the wrong way to do this. You don't want to give anybody in the world the ability to book you whenever you're not in an appointment. I feel like um, you should put boundaries around that. And, um, and some of the services like Calendly will let you do that to say, okay, uh, when I send out an invite, only make, you know, Tuesday afternoons and Mm -hmm. Friday mornings available. And, you know, in the name of all that is holy, do that. Don't just send them, you know, wide open access. I kind of do the same thing because I pay for fantastic out. And uh, when I have clients that want to meet with me or something, I actually just pick specific times with the fantastic Hal has the service where you can, you can put blocks on your calendar for a specific meeting and say, okay, I can meet you Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday at 2 PM. And then it sends them an email and they pick one of them. And then it updates the calendar for me when they pick one, but it's the same thing. I'm only giving them the times that I want to do it. Like I, for me, mornings are sacred. That's when I do my really heavy work and, I don't want to schedule meetings in the mornings. If at all, I can avoid it. Yeah. Boundaries are so important in all of the things and calendar is an easy one to start developing those, those boundary practices. It's an easy one to start working with your brain and, and show that you don't need to be available at all times for your clients. Yeah. When somebody sends me a Calendly uh, invite and I click it and I see that they've got like full days available to me to pick, I'm like, it just, uh, it just, it hurts me. I'm like, yeah. Oh, what are you doing to yourself? <laughs> yes. So we got, we got, you know, we're going to hit the, the, the Holy Trinity here. We got email, we got, we got calendars. Let's talk about task management. (laughs) And that's another one when you're working with teams, like as much as I like OmniFocus, it's not a great tool. If you've got three people working on the same list, you know, what, what, what are the task managers your clients are using? Which ones do you recommend? Yeah. Um, this is such a personal 
thing that there is, again, as this is my refrain, there is no one true task manager. Um, For my personal, here's what needs to happen for the day. I use my Hobonichi planner and write stuff down from all of the different task managers that I use. Um, I have several different Asana like worlds. I have Todoist. I have my calendar, my email, um, and anything that needs to happen is going to be pulled from whatever my client needs. Um, whatever system my clients use. And if they don't have one, um, when I start working with them, either they don't need it or we start talking to them and figuring out what is falling through the cracks, what needs to to get fixed, how can we support differently, how can we make a better option for all of this. Um, and so it it again, it helps with that context switching because I know that when I go into this Asana world, this is the project that needs to happen. Or if I'm using Trello, this is for that client because it's all branded for whatever client I'm working with. And so making sure that I have the notifications set up so that I will get, you know, an email um, when stuff changes so that I don't miss it. Because again, when I get that pop up that says there's a new email, I go in and I deal with it right away because it will usually take less than 30 seconds to do whatever setup needs to happen to make sure that I don't miss what's going on. Um, So I try to have not inbox zero because that's a lie, but I try to have no notifications so that when I do get something, I can very quickly switch over to see, oh, is this important? No, it's not. Cool. I'll leave it and, and, and go back to whatever I'm working on. That, that was a great answer, but I'm going to push you harder on this. Absolutely. <laughs> if somebody's listening and they have a team and they just don't know where to start, I mean, what are some of the bangers? You know, what are the ones that you would say, hey, this is one you should really look at and why? I mean, because you, you've seen the ones where they don't work and the ones where they yeah. do because you've got so many clients. I really, really like Asana. Um, it's been around forever, so it's really super stable. Um, there's different ways that you can view specific things. So if you want Kanban boards or if you want task lists or calendar based or any of that, um, most people will be a hundred percent fine with the free tier, which I'm always a big, um, proponent for trying things that have the free option and then paying for it when it's proven that it works as opposed to jumping all in. And then you've spent money on something that you don't use. Um, So Asana is usually the one that I end up saying, hey, this works for most of my clients. Um, We're actually, for my own business, I'm looking at switching to ClickUp just because they have a lot of automation things for like onboarding clients and and that sort of stuff. But again, that's a process and it's not something I'm going to recommend to clients yet until I know more about how it works. Um, And again, for my particular need, this is kind of where we're looking at, um, you know, with all of my free time to sit and tinker with uh, software. Yeah. And and I will say uh, from my own experience, when you're trying to implement a system like this, um, the software that the boss man or boss lady likes the best isn't necessarily the right software. You need to look at the software that resonates with the people who have to spend the most amount of time in it. Yes. And like uh, for if you are going to just be checking in on the list once or twice a day, but you've got uh, employees that are going to be in it all day, you have to make them part of that process. And it has to be something they can buy into or um, you're going to have a big problem. I, I did that with Basecamp. I, a couple of years ago, I bought a, a subscription to Basecamp, which was very expensive. But I thought, well, all my clients can then access their own, you know, I can share lists and things with clients. And what I found out was none of my clients like Basecamp. And so <laughs> I spent a bunch of money for a year that I didn't really get to use it that much. So so I, I really think you got to like look at who's the consumer of this in your business yes. and make sure they're in on it, too. And and how technical are they? Uh, yeah. A lot of a lot of times 
Um, there are wonderful clients that I work with that they can send an email and that's kind of about the limit of their technology, which is great. It's fine. It's totally, you know, it works. So we have to make sure that it's easy enough and intuitive enough so that they don't get frustrated and want to throw their computer out the window because they can't get it to work. Um, because if it doesn't work for them, it doesn't work for me. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And it's so interesting to hear about it because I'm not a task <laughs> sharer. Like, I don't share any with you. I don't share any with Mike. Yep. It's my own little little world. But I would imagine that I may be in the minority there. Very much in the minority. Very much. But the nice thing about that, Stephen, is you can have whatever system works for you. I mean, I yeah. do the same thing. My OmniFocus is my kind of my holy grail of tasks. But I do have things I collaborate with other people on, and I use whatever they like the most. And I just find a way to make it work in with my own system. But you, uh, it, it's a whole different animal when you got a team. Yes. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Indeed. Go to Indeed.com slash MPU to get a free $75 credit to upgrade your job post. If you're trying to build a brilliant AI, you need a Turing test. How about if you're trying to hire a brilliant thinker? You need Indeed assessments. When hiring gets hard, you need Indeed, the job site that makes hiring incredibly simple. Just attract, interview, and hire. In fact, with Indeed, you can do all of your hiring in one place, even interviewing. Don't just hope your perfect candidate will find you. Indeed hiring tools help you cut through the noise to hire faster and smarter. In fact, Indeed Instant Match provides a list of quality candidates whose resumes are on Indeed the moment you post a sponsored job. With Indeed assessments, choose from 135 skill tests to help make sure you're finding applications from people with skills you need. According to TalentNest, Indeed delivers four times more hires than all other job sites combined. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash MPU. Get that $75 credit at Indeed.com slash MPU. That URL one more time, Indeed.com slash MPU. This offer is valid through September 30. Terms and conditions apply. And our thanks to Indeed for their support of the Mac Power users and all of Relay FM. So, Kathy, we've spoken about your iMac Pro and your iPhone. Uh, haven't talked about where the iPad fits in that much. So, are you an iPad person? Where does that fit in for you? Yeah, I really realized how much of an iPad person I was um, when my iPad that I was using broke. Um, and I could no longer use it, uh, mainly for like entertainment type things. Um, and of course, with COVID, I haven't been traveling as much. I don't know if you know this, but it's difficult to take an iPad or an iMac Pro and travel with it. It is possible, but I don't really recommend it. Um, and so I haven't been traveling a whole lot before COVID. I uh, had a MacBook Adorable that did just enough work. Um, I would travel occasionally, and when I did travel, I would need just the bare minimum. But I needed, for the most part, I needed to use a desktop browser. Um, a lot of the the work that I do for clients is, uh, you know, web based, and they don't have an app, or the app doesn't do what it needs to do, and with the way that the iPad worked for so long, you had the mobile browser. Sometimes you could force the desktop browser, but sometimes it didn't work. And it was just really, really frustrating. Um, and so when the new iPads came out and the iOS allows for desktop browser to be kind of the default, it pretty much changed the game. Um, I have the newest M1 iPad Pro, the big boy, um, and it has been life-changing to be able to sit in my hammock and I'm going to do some spreadsheet work or doing some web-based work outside in the sunshine. Not now when it's, you know, 90 degrees, but hypothetically when it's 
cooler than that, um, sitting outside and, and kind of having the these micro mobility things to trick my brain into thinking that, oh, life is different. I can concentrate on just this one project for right now and get it done faster than I could maybe possibly sitting at my desktop because of the type of work that it is and and not get us distracted by by different things. Um, so it's been it's been pretty great. Um, I love the keyboard case. I wish that it flipped backwards so I could write like use it as you know the tablet a little bit easier. But I just bought a cheapo magnet based case that I can use to kind of protect the back while I sit and if I'm doing any sort of writing or drawing or whatever uh, on it. But it it it's great little workhorse and I'm excited for the future when I get to travel at some point in, you know, sometime maybe mm-hmm. um, <laughs> and, and just travel with my iPad. Yeah. Uh, let me just say that if I'm ever in a Starbucks and somebody brings in an iMac pro and plugs it in and starts typing on it, I am totally buying that guy or that gal coffee. I mean, yes. whatever they're drinking, I'm paying that for person it. Des- deserves to drink the, uh, the iPad as a mobile device um, is absolutely a thing. And the reason why Drain came on two weeks ago and said it definitely doesn't work for him, and you can come on and say definitely works for you, is all about use case. And I think listeners just need to kind of be mindful about what is it that they expect to do with an iPad, you know? And if you yeah. like, if you're someone like Kathy who has a bunch of online services that you work through to manage client stuff and you use Apple Mail, there's a ton of your work you can do on an iPad and these modern ones are super fast and these keyboards are great. Um, now that now they have trackpad support. Um, I can totally see why, you know, we could have one guest one week say no. And one guest two weeks later say yes. It's almost as if, everyone works a little bit different and there is no, no one way. true no <laughs> answer. I know. I know. It's a little, that uh, can't be it. yeah, no, no, that's not it. So sorry. I'm sorry for bringing it up. Clearly that was wrong. <laughs> now, now do you have cell cellular in your fancy new, new iPad? I do not. Um, I have a hotspot that I, um, uh, have through my wireless, um, through Verizon that I have if I need to, but most of the stuff I am on Wi-Fi and use my VPN to protect it. But otherwise I don't really need it. Or I'll, if I don't have my hotspot with me, I'll, you know, tether my phone, but it's very rarely that I've ever been in a situation like that where it becomes a thing where I would need the cellular. Now, now what, so VPN is one of the things you want if you're going to do this so you can protect yourself. What are some of the other key apps you use to to get your work done on your iPad? It's so hard because most of it is just Safari. So it's yeah. not very exciting. No. But, that, but that makes sense because like, like Asana and all these services you're talking about are probably accessed through Safari. Although I think Asana has its own native app, if memory it serves. It does, but it's not great. Yeah, um, they yeah. basically were like, oh, let's try and make this more functional. And it's like, yeah, but if you can't duplicate a task, that doesn't help me. <laughs> yeah, I have the same experience with Airtable. If I want to use Airtable on my iPad, the the web browser is about 100 times better than their app. Yeah. Um, so I'll do Dropbox. Mm-hmm. And of course, Timery is um, my time tracking app synced up through toggle. Um, but then I also like notability is my number one, like note taking app. So a lot of times if I'm doing, um, watching a movie or TV show or something for a podcast, I'll take notes in notability on my iPad so that I can easily access it on, um, my computer when it's time to record. Um, but I get the handwritten notes that are easy to read and 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 pay attention to when I'm writing instead of trying to like type it in and get distracted by whatever is playing on the show. All right. So there's a running battle with our listeners and in the forums between notability and good notes, you know, hundred percent. people are super passionate about it. <laughs> um, what are the features and notability you're using that, that make that the one for you? The, the, the reason that I use notability for this is the infinite scroll. So I don't have to worry about changing the page. Um, 
with GoodNotes, for a period of time, I tried using a digital planner. And GoodNotes was perfect for that because it had the structure of the individual pages that I needed. But when I'm taking notes on something, I want to know that I can just hit enter and a new page is going to happen or just scroll and a new page is going to work. I don't have to think about how many pages or or whatever is happening. Um, so yeah, I have and use both. But for the majority of the use case that I need, Notability is my go-to. Yeah, listeners, let us know if this is important to you because Steve and I have kicked around the idea of a show dedicated to these iPad note-taking apps. And I'm not sure if there's enough interest or not for it, but they they are very opinionated and they're very different, <laughs> but they're all good. You know, I mean, it's not like these are bad apps. So Kathy, you, you talked about notability in the iPad, but what's like a, what's a common trigger for you to, you know, back away from the iMac and pick up the iPad Pro? Is it certain types of tasks? Is it certain times of day? You mentioned some of those, but I'd like to, I'd like to know where people make that decision, like where that line is. Yeah. A lot of times if I'm later in the day and I have a project that doesn't take a lot of focus or doesn't need it, like a hardcore brain motion and I can sit in my hammock and I can relax a little bit, um, then I'll, I'll transition to the iPad. Um, for one of your projects, Stephen, I did it in the iPad because I knew it wouldn't take a lot of brain power to look up the things that I had to look up. But I wanted to get it done and being a little bit more comfortable also helped keep the distractions down. So I wasn't, um, I don't have notifications turned on on my iPad for pretty much anything. So I don't get the notifications when an email comes in unless I'm actively going and looking at the email. So I am able to sit and go through the a PDF that I'm working on and and do that work and concentrate on just that and really be in a focus mode, um, get it done, and then move on to whatever other project needs to happen. I think Apple has this vision of people just moving fluidly between their devices throughout the day. And what I found is pretty much what you said is there, there are certain things where I want to do that or, or make more sense. And like I said, that's always yeah. an interesting thing for me because I just, I don't work that way. Well, I mean, it's, it's funny if that's their position because they really don't have parity between the platforms. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, if if they wanted you to do be you know writing a word document and then jump to your iPad and continue, and you can do that, I, I understand that, but it's not really parity. Whereas, like for me, writing a word document is so much easier on the Mac, but but proofreading a PDF is so much easier on the iPad. And yeah, there it's like the, it really is more of a this is better for a different task than the, the fluid movement. And and when it comes down to it, it's that same sort of context clues and context switching that I use in so many different things. And and so mentally, I know, okay, this is what I'm working on and this is what I need to, to do. And so when I'm on my iPad, it's for, you know, A, B, and C only. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to review a PDF on my computer unless I absolutely have to or am making a PDF that's totally different. But if I'm just going through and checking things, iPad is by far the way to go. It's just so much easier to just boop, slide it up, move down, all of that. Yeah, that's one of the sort of the long running points about the iPad, right? Is that it is a better device for sort of that focused work because in the beginning it literally was just one app right before <laughs> yeah. the multitasking and slide over and all that stuff <laughs> but even now when not with all that stuff has come to the ipad even on the big ipad it's not quite the same as i mean i'm on my mac and i can see one two three four five six seven eight nine open windows across about seven different applications and even now with ipad os and all this stuff the iPad is still uh, easier to focus on, I think, because you have less of that stuff going on, uh, you know, out of the corner of your eye, for example. A hundred percent. Yeah, I have one, two, three. I have eight apps. And of course, I closed down the stuff so that I could focus on just you gentlemen. But yeah, I have, you know, these apps running and, and emergency notifications for particular things, but it's 
when I'm on my iPad, I'm just doing one specific thing. Um, I very rarely will be available for Slack messages or or emails or whatever because I'm doing this one project. And and I I like that. I like that work method. Um, and I think I'm okay having that be the way that I do it. We'll see when, you know, the future we get to travel again, how that changes my mind and I may end up needing a laptop, but for the most part, I think I'm okay. This episode of Mac Power Users is made possible by Pingdom. If you have a website, what purpose does it serve? Maybe it's driving people to your products or collecting sales leads for your company. Perhaps you're providing customer service with contact forms. Well, when these critical transactions fail, you're going to lose out on business. You're going to leave a bad impression with your customers. But there's a solution, transaction monitoring from Pingdom. Starting at just $10 a month, transaction monitoring runs checks 24-7. It will alert you when cart checkout forms or login pages fail before they affect your customers and your business. Pingdom will notify you the moment there is a failure over SMS, email, or your favorite apps like Slack, Ops Genie, or PagerDuty. And depending on what's being monitored or the severity of the outage, you can customize who is alerted and how they get that notification. So don't let users discover a problem with your website. You should be the first one to know. It's super easy to get started. Just go to pingdom.com slash RelayFM right now for a 30-day free trial with no credit card required. And when you're ready to buy, use the code MPU at checkout to get a huge 30% off your first invoice. Our thanks to Pingdom from Solar Winds for their support of the show and Relay FM. Kathy, we always like to talk at the end of these uh, interviews about some of your favorite apps and services, maybe something the listeners haven't heard of before that helps you get through your day. So give us some of your gems. Yeah. So um, Timery, hands down, is number one. Um, favorite app to talk about. Most people know about it. Um, but Not Timery really, Joe though. is great. Okay, good. Well, yeah. Joe is great. I love using apps that um, the developers are humans, if that makes sense. So I like being able to meet the people that create these these projects and these great, you know, things that they do. And um Joe is amazing. I was lucky enough to be on the the beta for the Mac version. And he was so willing and open for any changes based on how I worked. Um I love uh along those same vein, I really like affirmations, which is um an iOS app uh, from Justin Hamilton that just gives us little bursts of joy throughout the day. So I have the widget on my home screen that just says, you know, little things and it pops up once or three times a day that just has little things that says, Hey, you know, drink some water. Let's a let's, uh, you're doing great. The, just the little things that just make my my happiness work. Um, the app itself is in beta, um, but it hopefully will launch very soon. Um, and we can put a link in the show notes for accessing it um, when it comes out. Uh, now, before you go on, let me interrupt for real quick on Timery. We have not mentioned on this show, but the, that happened. Uh, Timery got a release for the Mac. And yes. It they he did it right, you know. So often these iPhone and iPad apps, they just kind of you know drop a version of the app onto the Mac because they can through Catalyst or some of the other Apple technologies, but they don't really think about it as a Mac app. Yeah. Whereas this app has really been thoughtfully designed. Like one of the the menu bars, and it gives you a list of all your favorite timers. Which suddenly on the Mac, if you use any sort of menu bar automation, gives you the ability to automate all your timers very easily. So if you've been resistant to time tracking uh, through something like uh, Toggle or Timery, and you're working on the Mac, suddenly you've got these great automation tools. Or like one of the things he's done is he's added the ability to have a new timer start when the last one ended. And just a lot of really nice little things. And this is an example of where the process of building a Mac app 
the developer learn things that he was able to bring back to the iPad and iPhone version. So all it's like, uh, what's it rising tide raises all boats. What is that saying? Stephen? I, <laughs> yeah, I, I think for, that's it. I think yeah, you got so it. Basically we had a rising tide here with timery and the app just got better across the board. Yeah. And, and what I, what I love about, uh, the way Joe works too, is that it's not as if, Hey, this is how I need it to be. And so I'm going to force it into the way that it needs to be done because this is how I use it. Um, being open to how other people use the app has grown and made the app better than it could have been without uh, other people's ideas and help and stuff. Yeah, I, I want to take credit for the uh, menu bar listing of all favorites because because I wrote him early. And I know he was working <laughs> on automation, but I said, look, if you just give me a menu bar with Keyboard Maestro, I can start and stop any timer I want. And I've been trying to automate toggle timers on the Mac for years with really weird API calls and yeah. web, you know, web <laughs> services. And it was just, <laughs> and everything I did was dumb and didn't work. And yeah, uh, this, using the, duct tape and bubble gum to try yeah. and make it work. Yeah, I did yeah. one where I was like using UI scripting where it would load the toggle app and then like the mouse would reach up and push a button. And, you know, you know, that stuff never really works very well. And now it's like just, it's a solved problem with this menu bar. Yeah, it's so smooth and great, and he's so reactive to everything, which is really, really nice. Now, I know Notability is a big, a big one for you. Um, are there any other apps on your your iPad? Because I really like this idea of working remotely with the iPad, but you've got to have the right tools for it. Are there any other apps that you find yourself opening a lot when you take the iPad on the road? I mean, I'll you I do a lot of like Google Drive. Google sure. Sheets, Google, all of all of that stuff, which is great because it is all synced across all of the of the devices. So it's nice and easy. A lot of my clients use Google and it works. I would argue that's the only thing that's great about it though, is that mm-hmm. the sync works. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. It's not it's not super great in a lot of ways, but it does the job that I need to do. Um and uh that's Pretty much. I mean, I have an app. I will do, you know, Adobe Draw um, for things. The um, Total Party Kill, White Sparrow um, episodes that are going out currently over on The Incomparable um, have show art and character art um, that I drew on my iPad using Adobe Draw. Wait, um, wait, wait. You're an artist too? <laughs> uh yeah. In back in my day, I wanted to be an animator um for Disney specifically. And so I went to school for animation and multimedia design. And then um they told me I had taken all of the wrong classes and it would take another like four or five years to graduate. So I switched to sociology. How did I not know this about you, Kathy? <laughs> because I'm really embarrassed because I don't think I'm very good. But uh, it's fun. And I like I like doing it. So occasionally I get to share it with the world. Yeah, I'm looking at the Adobe website. It's, it seems like your app may have changed out from uh, <laughs> underneath you. Um, yeah, according to the little pop-ups, it says uh, I need to either use Adobe Illustrator or Adobe Fresco. So... That's fun. Or I can keep using Adobe Draw. It just won't be updated, which honestly may be okay. Uh, Adobe tends to change things that don't need to be changed a lot. So I think I'll uh, just keep using the software that I use until it breaks. I've got this like image of like 20 people around a table. What if we called it Fresco? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, because clearly it needs a creative name. It can't be Adobe drawing. <laughs> or Illustrator for iPad. Like, right. come on. <laughs> yeah, uh, that would make sense. Mm-hmm. Well, Kathy, uh, we want to thank you for coming in today and talking to us about all this stuff. Uh, I learned of what an artist you are today. We, <laughs> <laughs> we covered a lot of apps. And uh, where do people find you? Yeah, you can find me all over the internet at Mrs. Soup on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, wherever. Um, come and hang out with us in the Relay Discord um, as a member at relay.fm slash, oh gosh, is it membership or memberships? Membership. Members. Membership. 
yeah, go there. <laughs> and tell us about your shows on Relay, because you're also, we didn't even talk about it, you're also a podcaster. I am. I am lucky enough to do Roboism with Alex Cox, where we talk about robots and tech and isms, but mostly robots. Uh, and then Conduit is a new show that I do with Jay Miller, where we talk all about um, life and productivity and how the two of them interact. Well, Jay Miller is awesome. He's been on The Automators and he's been on the Focus podcast. And I really dig this new Conduit show. I recommend everybody to go check it out. Well, thank you. Uh, we are the Mac Power Users. You can find us over at relay.fm slash MPU. Uh, thank you to our sponsors today. And that's our friends over at 1Password, Electric, Indeed, and Pingdom. You can find the forums at talk.macpowerusers.com. And we'll see you next week.